Well, welcome everyone to another um, conversation uh, on the polyvagal theory and how to be polyvagal informed. Uh, today, I'm delighted to be with Dr. Nilufer Merchant. I hope I, I, every time I pronounce it in a different way, so I hope I got the, the right this time. Um, you said it perfectly. We, yeah, we met at the PVI conference last year. And I was really taken by your presentation and your point of view coming from a different background with a different cultural background. So I'm, um, I'm super delighted to have this conversation with you. Welcome, Nilofer. Thank you, Manal. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah. So let's get right to it. How about that? Um, how did you come to... You know, you're a licensed psychologist. I, I, I don't I don't know if I mentioned that. So you've been in this field for, for quite a long time. How did you come across the polyvagal theory, which is what the common theme in all our conversations now? And how did it shift, if any, your work? Well, thank you, uh, by the way, and thank you for to everyone who has joined today. Um, well, to, to give you just a little background, because I think the when we met at the conference, uh, there were lots of connecting points for us, mm -hmm. and partly it was um, both of us were Muslim, yes. and we came from countries that um, either um, practiced Islam or it was, you know, um, you were immersed in that. So... Part of my journey has been in the field of mental health, you know, just I'm originally from India and my did some of my training, my education there, and then came to the US, has been in the traditional forms of Western psychology, obviously, and, the, and then counseling. And as I was um, not only as a student, but when I went on to teach at a university, um, my my fundamental question has always been. So how does this relate to the most of the world, right? Yes. <laughs> the rest of the world. The non-Western, uh, <laughs> which is the majority of the world, yes. Right, right. Um, because um, especially when I, when I would learn all these different concepts, which uh, all of it was very helpful, very good. But I clearly there was a lack of... Um, incorporating sort of a collectivistic view, a lack of uh, understanding different value systems. It was very much based on individualistic value systems. Um, so my, my journey, my quest throughout my career has always been to see how we can uh, use these theories, these practices that we're learning and be able to uh, use them so that they're effective with other groups, other cultural groups, other racial groups. Um, and, and side by side, I was also really interested in social justice issues. And so working in the community, trying to organize in the community, um, and very intuitively throughout my career, I've always tried to create safe spaces for mm -hmm. people. Um, in the community or whether it is in the university setting, whether it is school settings, whether in agency settings, and I always try to figure out, so how can we bring people together so that they feel safe? Yeah. So, and then as I was teaching, it, it, uh, a lot of my um, scholarship has been in the area of multicultural counseling. And worked on developing multi multicultural counseling competencies to work, you know, how can we be effective? So fast forward, you know, and several years later, in fact, just about six or seven years ago, I came across polyvagal theory. And as soon as I um, learned about it, I was immediately drawn to it. I think I think you and I have talked about this, that there is there is that aha moment of saying, oh, this this really fits. Yes, I, I think it's this, you know, I've heard this from many, many people. It's like, yeah, that makes sense. I feel that. Yeah. Right. Because when the polyvagal theory, as it um, 
relates to our nervous system and understanding safety based on autonomic nervous system, it is starting, it names things that we already know. Yes. Right, what we intuitively have known. And safety is the premise for polyvagal theory, right? So what are the cues of safety and what are the cues of danger? And I think for people who have experienced marginalization in many different ways, or have felt invisible, or have felt oppressed, or have um, been hurt by uh, systemic levels of oppression, they immediately recognize what it means when my autonomic nervous system is not safe because that that those cues have already been picked up. Yes. Right. So I think when I started to learn about polyvagal theory, I felt like this was really a good way. It, it gives us a foundation and it, it gives us a language across cultures because we're not talking about emotions. We're not talking about thoughts. We're not talking about behaviors. We're talking about nervous system level at, the, at that foundation level. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, the thing for me, at least, uh, the the feeling or the sensing of of not feeling safe was very hard to put on words of why I feel sometimes uncomfortable. Uh, so many adjectives that I personally put on the situation, but with feeling of unsafe is like, yeah, this is it. And it's not physical uh, unsafety. So it's not like someone is, you know, attacking or being aggressive is that a sense of safety from a neuroception point of view, which is part of the polyvagal theory of, you know, there is a threat that right. my system, my nervous system is detecting and I might not be yet aware of. Exactly. And then I think the, the part about polyvagal theory then is, is also trying to build on that a little bit, because when we talk about safety, because I've had, you know, as you may have had, we've had many, many conversations about safety with people who feel marginalized or feel, or feel uh, threatened in some way, um, that safety is relative. And safety is based on power and privilege. So the more power we have, the more and the more privileges we have, the more safe we feel, right? And so when we think about cues of safety and cues of danger, one of the things that I know um, both um, Stephen Porges as well as Deb Tana talk about is, you know, what are the cues of safety and cues of danger? And do the cues of safety outweigh the cues of danger? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that when we look at it from a con context of um, people who are in the margins, and I mean people in the margins, I mean it in a, in a more of a global way, because you we're marginalized in many ways. You know, we're marginalized by by race, by gender, by sexual orientation. We're marginalized by uh, in terms of uh, economic uh, status, right? Mm -hmm. Um, ability, so many different levels of it, and also Religion just marginalized place. in yes. terms of where you are globally. Yes, absolutely. Right? So, what is the so when we think about that and the cues of safety and cues of danger? My my question is: Well, there are cues of danger. There, there's oftentimes more cues of danger than there are cues of safety for people who are in the margins. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? You know, how does that then translate for the person either, the, either in the session or when, as you're working in communities, how do, you, how do you balance that out? How do you create those cues of safety? Mm -hmm. And I, I have more, Manal, I have more questions than I have answers. Yeah, so I think the point of this conversation hopefully is to stimulate some uh, dialogue around this so that what is it that, you know, what is it that we need to work towards? Yeah, I think when it, it there isn't any way an answer and your answer might be, you would figure, find it's the answer today right now and maybe with one person because there isn't any, 
one rule that applies to everyone. We're all in different nervous system. We are in different nervous system kind of flow or state every time. So there isn't any um, one rule. And uh, just to kind of bring it to a practical thing, you know, sometimes keys of safety is is the facial features, uh, the social engagements, like, oh, there's a, a level of recognition, understanding, a smile, um, you know, uh, is there welcome is what I'm saying. If I'm a client is what I'm saying. I, I'm, when I'm sharing uh, what I'm feeling or something about my faith and what is that, do I feel that whoever, you know, counselor, therapist, or even a friend is, is getting, is not, pulling out instead of yeah and that's a very simple way of uh, of putting it so it's it's very i would say complex um at the same time i don't want to make it sound like it's very complicated and it cannot be doable cannot be done um i think it's when we are regulated ourselves we find our own our own way of regulating yourself and also to be educated about the populations that we might be working with. I find it very uh, interesting. And I, I think that's why we wanted to have this conversation is like religion and faith has, I've seen has been absent in many um, settings, especially in psychotherapy. And now I live in the UK and I, and I sense that more than when I used to live in the US. And, and that's what I think a lot of people don't understand, especially from coming from, I come from Saudi Arabia. So it's majority uh, country, Muslim countries, uh, majority Muslim country. And even if uh, a person, even living there is not practicing, faith is not a practicing Muslim it's the religion is part of everyday life and you would see the same um, people in different countries in Egypt in Lebanon in, in different countries in the Arab world even if they're not religious themselves and practicing religion is part of everyday life and when that is taken out of the context of the conversation in psychotherapy it becomes um there is a level of threat of, oh, uh, is it okay for me to speak about um, those things? And maybe in a way this, we could guide the conversation into beginning with the beginning of what decolonization uh, of mental health means, because uh, I'm sure a lot of people with us here today and who be listening have come across this decolonizing um, mental health. And again, especially from where I come from, where we Saudi Arabia was not colonized. So people don't have a very abstract idea what that means. And they think that it might not apply or any of that, but it's, it's the concept is still the same of how we can bring it back. So yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I just also want to pick up on your point of the religion piece, which yes. I think is a really important one to, to follow up on, because essentially what that has done by taking out the, the, by not addressing religion, we have essentially made a whole group of people invisible, or we have dismissed their way of life. And so decolonization really is, a, it's, it's sort of a, a, been a movement for some time. Um, but I think it's really sort of showing up in the field of psychology. Um, I think sometimes the word liberation psychology has been used and then as, as a movement where we're, it's not just um, addressing how Western concepts and how Western theories can fit uh, different cultural groups, but really re-looking really at what is the origin of psychology and Western psychology. So decolonization, just to kind of give you a brief explanation is, is that uh, for many of the many countries in the world, as well as the US has been colonized by where uh, people in those that who are indigenous to those communities essentially have been made to believe that they are savage and that they, uh, that they are um, uh, not worthy, um, they're lesser than. And this has sort of 
per been pervasive in the psyche of people as a result of that. I come from a country that was colonized for 500 years. And so I know this very well in terms of firsthand how that feels. So colonization essentially is how do you, it, it's sort of taking over land or taking over the people, taking over the politics and it's the subjugation of people, right? So, but even if countries have not experienced colonization, they feel the impact of colonization because colonization has been so worldwide. And there's a sense of white supremacy. There's a sense of, you know, Western Westernization being more superior to other forms of um, uh, cultures or religions or, you know, practices or way of life. Um, and so, and then also there's a, there is a colonial mentality that comes about as a result of colonization, uh, which is where people feel that they're not good enough. You know, we have, I think, we, I know you've probably addressed the imposter syndrome, where we feel like, well, we don't know enough about things or our voice is not important, right? Yeah. And so, um, or the, the, you know, there's so many isms that play out in this as well, like the colorism, right? So people who are darker skin versus lighter skin, and where did that come from? That com came from, has roots in colonization. Um, and so, I mean, there are lo lots of aspects around that, but that sense of inferiority that exists amongst people and that, and therefore um, feel like they cannot, don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And so the decolonization process is essentially um, trying to uh, bring back the people from the margins into the center and recognizing the lived experience of people. You know, there's a, a definition that I really like that has been used by some of the scholars. It is the psychology of a people, by a people, and for a people, mm. right? And it, is, it is, and it is rooted in the contextual realities of the people. So, this is a little bit different from, you know, what multicultural counseling or psychology, where we're often trying to say, okay, this is how you work with this group of people, and this is how you work with this group of people, or these are the competencies you need to have. And all of that is important. But when we address colonization and decolonizing psychology, we're going to the deeper roots of it. And a lot of things can be traced back. Like, so in, for instance, the medical model that we use, right? It's very much a Western concept of how even to a Western, Yeah, even, I'm sorry to cut you off, but even to add another layer is like most anatomy, um, you know, studies are done and figures and books are done on male uh, bodies. Yes, uh, which is that's that that <laughs> I don't want to get the this conversation a, a, a lot deeper and, and bigger, but that's also another level of looking at things from a different lens. There are many layers of it, actually. Yeah. It's very complex. I mean, I don't want to simplify it, but it's you know it's rooted in imperialism, it's rooted in capitalism, it's rooted in you know oppressed um, reg oppressive regimes. You know, so it, it's 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 all of that, and it and of course there's that whole concept of um, owning, and somehow that now this has become mine, and I'm going to sell it to you, right? And I think one of the things that we're finding, I mean, I know that you and I have had this conversation, is that. Um, so now we're recognizing that, that there are lots of concepts around ancient practices and ancient wisdom that are actually very helpful to our nervous system. And as we talk about self-regulation and co-regulation, mm -hmm. um, that this is this is what these these are the concepts that are basic to collectivistic cultures and has been there for thousands of years, right? But there's a sense that. Um, we can take this and then market. And then so, so a lot of times these are marketed back to us and we're thinking, wait a minute, we already know this stuff, right? Yeah. Or we're already doing this stuff, right? Yes, yeah. It, it, it's cool, quite a bit tricky and it gets in a vicious cycle because I, there is that Western complex, Western knows, uh, you know, uh, science and all of that is, it, it's better. So I've seen this happen over and over of like, um, whatever group is dismissing their own culture or their traditions. 
as like, oh, this is not scientific or this is, you know, not whatever. You can fill in the blank. And then um, trying to adapt to new theories or new practices that are not connected to us in any way um, until someone, you know, from the Western world says, oh, this is great. You know, fasting is really good for you. Oh, so now we're all going to fast. But, you know, and, and, I, and I don't think any of us here are putting any blame or any uh, thing on other, but this is the reality of what it happens. Um, so I think a part of it is, I feel for myself, is let, let me take a, you know, a pause, a step back and see um, reconnect with my own roots, with my own traditions, and see how I could, how these things work for me, because any tradition or ancient wisdom hasn't, and we, we say it, ancient wisdom, didn't come from an, a void of just someone deciding, let's do this. There is a, a huge wisdom uh, behind it, and I think until we reclaim this as our own, and we own it, um, it becomes that whole colonization imperialism kind of complex that we wanna we want someone outside of us to validate what we can already know. Right. But I think we're, we're we're taking this conversation to a different well, think, direction. <laughs> well, no, I think what you're saying is very important because I think that we're, what we're saying is that we need to ground the yeah. ways that we work with people and whether it is our healing practices or whether it, are, you know, uh, it is well-being of any sort, that we really need to ground that in the, in the cultural and indigenous healing practices. Mm -hmm. um, we also need to recognize you know, that we're also recognizing the, that our, it's not just the evidence-based practice, but the practice-based evidence, right? Because our lived experience is important. My story is important. Your story is important. Our testimony in this place is important. And, our, and so we need to hear voices that are not represented in, in the field. And what I find is that, uh, Manal, and you might have experienced this too, is that in a lot of trainings that I go to, conferences that I go to, um, it's predominantly white, right? And so there's a lot of work that has been done that is very based on individual individualism, individual values. And it and because the focus is on working with the individual and the for, for so for instance for trauma, right? When we're looking at trauma, we are looking, we are addressing trauma from the perspective of your life experiences. One may not necessarily be taking a look at all of the different layers of trauma that can occur from in terms of the the uh, intergenerational trauma, in terms of historical trauma, in terms of the socio-political environment that we live in, what is the, and I, I like to use the word geo-socio-political. I know uh, some, for some folks they use eco, which get, gives a picture of the larger system. And I'm starting to use geo because I think the geographical location is very important in terms of where the, the, the social and the political and the cultural milieu that is there is so unique to different places in the world. And that it also gives us a global perspective because when we think about just what's happening in the US, you know, in fact, it, it, there is a lot of the focus in terms of even um, uh, decolonizing is looking at things from the Western, from the U.S. perspective, and I know that there is a real effort to broaden that and to invite voices all over the world. Mm -hmm. And what would psychology and mental health look like if we centered the experience of people and and went from the inside out instead of the outside in? I think it would is transformational. I know for me. It has been a very, it actually has been very uh, liberating for me mm -hmm. because it really gives me the freedom to question a lot of things mm -hmm. and the right to question it. Because for instance, who said that we can't 
love our clients, right? Or that we can't touch our clients. And I actually trace some of that back. And I and it the roots has it, the roots are in the psychoanalytic field. Like you know, that you have to be a blank slate, you have to be separate from your client, you can't touch your client. There are all these transfers, counter transfers. Not to say that, not to say that, that has that is not important and that it absolutely has to be used with a lot of care. But where did that come from? We, begin, we need to question, you know, we've disconnected the emotions, the, the, the larger uh, context of how our emotions are uh, and how our nervous systems yeah. respond. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, the yeah. bigger systems. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing. I think back to what you said earlier, we don't have all the answer, but the questioning of how does this, you know, apply to me or how does it, does it integrate with what I'm doing? Is it, is it in line with my belief system, with my understanding of the world? One of the things that I've seen a lot of kind of not debate, but uh, unfortunate um, you know, um, therapy uh, is on the uh, on codependence, and to to look at um, at it from an individualistic society, looking into like um, a holistic society where where the family unit is very important, where the, even the extended family is 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 very important would look at that, uh, you know, from looking from the individualistic societies, like they would see that as a codependency and it's like a pathology to, to work with. And it's completely different view from living in, yes, we live in a holistic um, society. And I think I'm, I'm missing the word that it's, <laughs> uh, um, that I want to say. A, in a collectivistic Collective. and a communal Thank society, you. right? Yes, yeah. that, that yes. It is important to to respect your parents and you know honor them, and it's important to you know connect with your family and uh, your uncles and so so there is a different view of where I uh, am I in this you know exactly. um, experience uh, that I'm not it's just, it's not just about me it's yes. We, we need to heal that part that kind of dismissed the individual completely, but, but it's not to go to the extreme of, it's only about me. And that's all I need to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think what, you know, in terms of polyvagal theory, this and just exactly what you talked about, the coach fantasy, it normalizes the co-regulation uh, focus in polyvagal theory, I think really helps to understand why we do what we do in our collectivistic cultures, because cultures that are um, communally oriented, um, are group oriented, it's, a, it's, it's all about we, right? It's, it's not about who I am, it's not about me, but it's about we. Yeah. And so we, we're, it's always in relationship to people. Mm -hmm. And it's also, you know, so many of our practices yeah. in our, you know, in whether it is in the Muslim culture, whether it is in, you know, the Indian culture, whether it is in the, you know, various parts of the world in the African culture, that, that there is that piece of connection and, uh, being able to uh, be there for for someone else from it's not and it's not it's a very genuine space of caring and love that we experience and also uh, a lot of times I know I grew up for instance in very small spaces mm -hmm. so you can't help but be in everybody's business <laughs> Of course, there's the, the the downside of it is that everybody yes, knows your yes. business, right? Yes. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but at the same time, when 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 someone is in need, everyone is there, no matter what. So so it's not really. I, and I want to just I, I remind them for myself for and everyone. It's not about who is better or what is better or what is not. I think um, one of the things that kind of get lost in traditions 
is that we uh, we don't have a full understanding of why it's done, what's the point of it, what's the reason? Because I grew up in a generation, if we question our elders, like, why do we do this? It's always, you know, you don't ask, you just, do, <laughs> this is what we've been doing and, and you just do it. And, and with that, we, we lose some meaning of these um, uh, traditions and gatherings and these co-regulatory kind of events that you spoke about. And I, and I think that's one of the th things that I really want to uh, also highlight and not have it um, missed in this conversation is the value of um, the connection, these practices that we all know. So can you speak a little bit more about that? And I know you have a, a, a TEDx video about having tea and how tea is such a, um, an important part of uh, everyday life. Right. I think what I started to get really curious about is what is it that we're doing in our everyday life? Mm -hmm. And what are the practices that are in place? whether they're cultural, whether they're religious, they're spiritual, that are already that we're already doing when we are either self-regulating or co-regulating. And I think tea drinking, I think it's, an, it's a very beautiful space where we, we share with other people, we're drinking tea, the, the benefits of tea, all of that, right? And also, you know, I know that um, many of your um, viewers, for instance, are from the Islamic countries or, uh, you know, are, uh, identify themselves as Muslim. And this being the month of Ramadan, especially, I think that there is so much that is happening within that space that is, that is so beautiful. So for instance, you know, um, let's just take, uh, let's just take the prayers, right? The namaz, right? So when we pray, and these are these align with some of the polyvagal concepts of co-regulation, right? We pray in unison oftentimes. If we're going to the mosque, we're all praying together, we're moving together. Um, you know, and of course I know that there, there's lots of differences even within the Islamic communities and the sects and different ways of practicing. So I want to honor that, but generally in Islam, it, there's a whole uh, focus on how can we be equal, yeah. right? Which also relates to the, the whole decolonization uh, aspect because we're looking at equity and how do we create social justice in this space, right? So uh, Islam is built on social justice principles and equity. So, you know, the, the, the aspect of fasting is how can we relate to people who are hungry? as well as you know, devote our time to spiritual practices during this time, right? Um, at the breaking the fast for iftar, you know, a lot of families get together, a lot of communities get together. I know I'm part of community, a small community that um, um, eats together uh, when they break their fast. Uh, when, when we eat, we are all uh, sitting on uh, with one large plate. Um, and we are all sitting around and eating from that same plate. So a lot of these things are co-regulation. Um, in that space, and I've been really observant in, in when I go to the mosque now to see how people interact because there are so many ways that they are co-regulating during that time. Food is a is a, a, a great way that we co-regulate, right? Our, our cultures are built on food and we, we honor other people through food. We show our love and respect by the food that we serve Absolutely. and that it is considered to be an honor to serve others. And, I'm, and this, of course, you know, I know this is true for a lot of cultures, so it's not just the Islamic culture, but I'm just highlighting that some of these things are happening. So if we know that if, when, we, when we can bring in some of these um, concepts from neuroscience and um, polyvagal theory on, on how this is helping our nervous system, that these are places that um, communities have created to feel safe, right? and to feel connected with each other, to be in community with each other. 
um, of course, not. it may not feel safe for everyone because yes. if you feel forced to go there, you're not feel safe. Yes. But for people who willingly want to go yes. and want Absolutely. to participate and feel that, um, that pull towards that, that that really is a place, right? The other thing in terms of um, the, the, just the prayers, right? So if, whether it is five times or three times, you know, in, in our community, we combine some of the, the practices, the, the prayers, but there's movement. There is, uh, there is um, ritual. Yeah, I, and, I think um, one of, the, one of the, the essential things are, you know, and I think, and I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> I, it's not that I do that every time that I pray. Right. If, when I'm kind of conscious and I'm aware, is that creating that pause of life, 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 take a pause, you know, go w wash, uh, take some time to breathe and center and ground. And, and when that, it does create those, you know, pockets throughout the day um, and that is like grounding, like connecting, like I'm, I'm, I'm shutting everything in the world off. And it's, it's quite very, um, meditative it, it has a lot of things and I <laughs> a lot of times I get the most if I'm stuck with something and that's actually something um like my mom have taught me everything you know her life solution to everything is like okay go make wudu and and pray to rakaz that's like you know if you're if you're getting upset because <laughs> because my dad said no I can't go to my friends okay go go and and, and pray to Rakaz if you want something if I want to get good great that's everything if something good happens do that so and and with that uh and as a young child I, I didn't remember I, I I didn't get it as a teenager it's like I'm furious and and I want to just kind of angry and my mom would tell me go do that but as I grow, grow older I realized it does create that gap uh, that I don't have to react that it gives me time to respond and it's like even if I'm I'm not just just actually going and splashing water in my face brings me that so there's a lot of things that's like yeah we need that pause and every you now creating a pause, slowing down is so important. So those- We're resetting our nervous system, right? In, in polyvagal yes. theory terms, <laughs> we're yes. resetting our nervous system. We're, we're getting ourselves out of, you know, sympathetic or dorsal um, into ventral. So for instance, I had a client uh, who, um, so where I live, we have, um, we have a large Somali community um, many of them have uh, moved here as a result of being refugees. And so um, I was working with, uh, with a client who was in complete dorsal, complete shutdown space. Um, and her very traumatic history that she was not ready to share. Mm -hmm. um, and it, people were around her were very, it was very difficult for them to do anything with her. So we literally started with like, you know, where, tell me about uh, what is important to you? Mm -hmm. And what do you do and prayers and listening to the Quran, or the d doing her prayers was important. Well, that was great because that's where we started. Let's have that, you know, are you okay with trying to at least make sure? And she wasn't praying every time because that was, she was so much in dorsal that she couldn't even do that. And so we said, okay, can you listen to the Quranic verses? Because that's what she could, she could do. So helping, so religion, you know, in, in, from the Islamic perspective, religion is such a big, it is, it's part of life, right? So it, it, true religion is how we have learned to regulate ourselves. Just as your mother told you to go to wudu and, you know, to play the two rakats, that that was a way to reset your nervous system. That was a way to calm your nervous system. So how can, I think part of what I've been really interested in is how can we be more intentional? Now, yeah. as we know that these practices are helping us, yes. can we fully engage in them in a way that is helpful to us? 
So um, Dr. Porges talks about rituals, for instance, as uh, creating, it, it helps to create safety. Yes, predictability. Structure allows us to create safety. So knowing that at this time of the day, you know, I, I need to pray at this time of the day, or this is what's going to happen at this time of the day. I start my fast at this time. I break my fast at this time. It's all very, very structured and structure helps our nervous system feel safe. And, and so those rituals, so there's lots of things in various religions and various practices, whether it, whether it is Christian and Jews or Muslims or Hindus, that there are lots of rituals Mm-hmm. And that's where I feel that some of the the ways that um, uh, the, the the practices within each culture, within each religion, in itself, is helping people. So uh, rather than trying to bring in things, to yeah. say that you know this is how men, what mental health looks like, and this is what you need to do why we need to start with within the community to see what people are doing we need to be out so part of decolonization you know what does it mean to decolonize your practice it means that we need to open it up to the community we need to be in the community we need to look at what are what are the healing spaces in the community Um, healing does not necessarily have to happen in an office Right. Now, of course, this means, you know, in especially in the US, like, how do you work with insurance companies and, you know, yes. uh, managed healthcare, all that kind of stuff is, is, is a challenge. But if we begin to open things up in different ways, and to think about, okay, these community gatherings that are happening every night are healing for a lot of people. Yeah. And so how can we maybe work with with those communities in the ways that they're already doing things um, rather than saying, you know, you should be doing all of these other things, which nobody has time in the day anymore to add more things to their day, right? (laughs) And I think the, the, the new term that I've recently started to listen is social prescription, which is connecting with others. And I just wanna re reaffirm that you know co-regulation even on a from a polyvagal perspective is is you have that connection to to self uh, or you know within yourself with um in nature uh with others and with spirit as well so these are the the, the that's how we co-regulate i think i'm i'm i'm, I'm putting it right <laughs> I, I, I... I absolutely, I think, can I add to that? Yes, yeah, because yeah, I please. think that that connection, so so even in the polyvagal theory, even though we're talking about the spirit, we're not really, I don't know that I've seen much discussion about how we're co-regulating with spirit. So like, you know, what is what is happening in that space? So co-regulating, you, you know, we, we see a loving, perhaps we see a loving God, we see, a God that takes care of you. We see a God that has, um, you know, in terms of all of the facial features or characteristics in terms of a, a, a God that really cares about you and that will hold space with you, right? And everything, for instance, if you're looking at it from the Islamic perspective, everything goes back to prayer and to God, right? Yeah. To Allah, right? Everything is in relationship to that. Mm-hmm. Even how we greet each other and yes. how we, you know, say inshallah, you know, everything is in relationship to God. So how, when, when we begin to name these things for people and to valid, that is validating. Um, there's a, there's a study that I was um, just looking at recently that it basically it took uh, 300 articles um, that were written around uh, counseling Muslims missing mm-hmm. and how is it how how is it that um, we can better serve that community um, and one of the things you know I mean there were lots of different findings as well as that they're put together but one of the things I've talked about is that when we engage with the community and when we when we work with them in 
identifying what are the issues and what are the healing practices, maybe work with the imams if needed. And, and because a lot of times people are going to the imams. And so I know for when we, I did a lot of training in, uh, for uh, people who worked with refugees. So I was training the train, the, the service providers and we looked at how they can work with the imams in the community so that they can re begin by educating and looking at, because there's so many mental health issues that the levels of trauma that people are experiencing are so great and there is no way to even address it. And it only shows up in the hospital system because it shows up in physical symptoms. You know, So people who have been in refugee camps, people who are, uh, in, who are experiencing war, um, people who are, have escaped uh, oppressive regimes, people who are now having to live in other countries and feeling the experiencing racism and you know all of the uh, levels of oppression so there are so many layers and we're even in when we're talking about trauma is it an individualistic perspective like you know is is that a western perspective that trauma is the way it's being defined even mm -hmm. even in terms of the dsm yeah. You know, there is no way to talk about cultural levels of trauma, the bigger levels of trauma, you know, so how one of the things if you want to talk about it in polyvagal theory terms, where as we talk about mapping the nervous system, because we're map mapping where is your autonomic nervous system yeah. at, and whether you're in the shutdown place, the dorsal, the sympathetic, the fight or flight space or the ventral. Well, it's not as simplistic for people who are de dealing with very many different levels of um, uh, uh, danger and yeah. threat. So oftentimes I'm thinking it's, you know, Deb Dana, I love, I love her explanation around the, the ladder. I think it's a beautiful way. I, I, I use that a lot in my work, but when you think about it, do we, it's almost like, I feel like we have multiple ladders at the same time mm -hmm. and we have one leg in one on one ladder, one arm in another ladder, and maybe we're in one ladder. So it's the both and spaces, right? Yeah. I know the, um, Dr. Purgis um, calls it hybrid spaces, that we can exist in more than one space at one time. But I think that sometimes is the lived reality of people where it is the both and. And this is how it also connects to uh, liberation psychology and, decol and how we look at decolonizing is that there is that perspective of both and that we are oftentimes experiencing safety as well as threat at the same time. Absolutely. It's, it's never and so our nervous systems are feeling both those poles. Yes, it's possible that in, in this relationship right now with you, I feel safe, but I might be talking to you perhaps in a context of a very oppressive environment and so i'm constantly my my cues of safety and danger and this is where power privilege comes into play is i'm always my neuroception are looking for cues of safety and danger i can be safe with you but i'm in an, another system which is very unsafe so how do we hold both spaces and so when we map so what i've started doing with my clients is that we start mapping the different spaces that we're in, not just in terms of where the nervous system is at when you're working with you individually, but also how can we map, you know, perhaps it's looking at sort of more of the uh, collective nervous systems yeah. and what is happening because it feels like, you know, I can step out of here and I could be fully in a place of threat. And how do I handle that? knowing that that's it, I have to be prepared to to deal with that. So the, it, it feels like we need, I don't know, this might be a question for uh, people who are uh, more immersed in uh, both polyvagal theory and liberation psychology, is to really begin to take a look at the multiplicities, the levels of multiplicity that are there, and that how can we within that create safe spaces because can we can we work with 
communities, for instance, in, in the US, do we, can we work with perhaps what we refer to as the BIPOC community, the black, indigenous, people of color communities? Like, can we have our training specifically focused on BIPOC communities? Because I've participated in trainings like that and it's incredibly healing because we're not doing the code switching. Yes. <laughs> Yes. We've talked about code switching, right? Yes. That when we go from one setting to another, we code switch and people who are in marginalized, who are marginalized in the system are constantly code switching. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Or we even in your in, in within a culture that you don't feel marginalized, you're also code switching because yes. you're going from one setting to another. Yeah, there is there is I think there is a level of code switching all the time that that happens. It's just on a different uh, um, level on, and how often uh, it is that uh, that happens. And I, I I remember I can't remember who is talking about you know uh, creating a safe um, environment at least. I like the way she puts it, safe enough. And I think that links to what you're saying that both end, like, okay, I, it, it might take, I don't know what it would take, because again, if we put new reception is and what is safety, it becomes very, you know, different from one person to another. It's like, how can we make it safe enough to, to at least start to get the conversation out? Because if I don't feel safe to speak out or ask, um, about um, something, um, there is the voices out, but I might not feel safe to tell you my life story, but at least I could start. And I just want to, you know, bring it back that I do really appreciate Dr. Porges when he talks about the co-regulation and co-regulation with spirit. And I do understand even coming from a scientific community and all that, uh, that, that the, the connection to spirit might not be defined with, for a lot of individuals, but it is there. And that's one of the things. So whatever that spirit is, it could be higher power, nature, whatever it is, it has its very important place. And even that, you know, again, it's not defined or there isn't any, and that's where another layer of, of you know, what scientific evidence is because spirituality and connection with God, it's not something that you can put in, you know, a scientific empirical, you know, evidence space because it's untangible in a way. Um, so, um, however, our nervous systems are tangible. Yes. yes <laughs> and I think, right. And, and, and that's what I, I think we, uh, and that I share that with many people who are also polyvagal informed and, and uh, try to adapt the theory in their, pra uh, in their um, practices is that the nervous system is the same. So we could talk about, we don't need to talk about all the things, the emotions, the history and all that. It's what is the nervous system responding to? Is, it feel, is there enough ventral? Is it you know, safe enough? Uh, is there, you know, I love Dr. Porges, what, I, and I'm paraphrasing him, it's like what we aim is to be good enough co-regulators in life. So is that, that's, right. that's the, um, the essence of what we want to reflect on and see how we are doing it in ourselves first, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I, 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 I have a lot of regard for um, Dr. Porges and, and Deb Dana for the, the incredible work that they have done and the, the contribution to the field, because I think that, as I said, it actually parallels for me in terms of as I'm working with the decolonization aspect, because it gives us a way to look at things fundamentally from a very different perspective. It's not what techniques do I use, but how am I with you so that you have enough cues of safety mm -hmm. that you can even access what it is that I am here for or for what you are here for. Yeah, and I, yeah. again, I do also appreciate, <laughs> I, I so love the polyvagal theory and it changed my life and I find it very, um, easy to understand as simple to understand not easy to implement because it takes time to get with that but also the openness of of um you know uh steve dr porges and, and deb dana in in not wanting to have the guidelines on this is how you do it 
there's and I think uh, I don't know if you noticed that, but I felt that was very evident in the in the in the summit, where like this is you know it's not my it's it's my, not my theory it's not my work it's like put it out there and see how it um, how everyone can uses it when, which I think this is what when you speak about bringing to the community of like oh so how how does you know polyvagal theory shows up. So polyvagal theory existed throughout history, and Dr. Porges, in his lab, created the scientific names and st scientific stru structure. So it sort of kind of just gave it a word. It did not invent it. So right. I think it's it's an, a matter, and I go back to your beginning, it's like a lot of questions. And I this is what I really hope people who are with us here today and uh, will listen to this uh, conversation. It's like questions like, what brings me those glimmers of, of, of ventral and, 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 and safety? What, where do I sense it? And I just realized we're coming to the end of the hour. And I, I, <laughs> I told our audience, uh, you know, our who are here with us live that if they have any questions to put in the chat or ask and i i did not give them any time to ask questions but um i'll in the next few minutes if you have any questions please put it in or we'll uh, we'll see a time a time really flew by i did not notice the hour and i know we could go for another hour if we um <laughs> if we just let ourselves go yeah. There's so much we can talk about here. Yes. yes. So, in and I, I'm, 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 I'm sort of lost in words. I don't want to say in conclusion. I don't want to say at the end because I, I know we were going to have more conversations. If we want to have like concrete or practical uh, things, where in as individuals in their daily lives or practitioners. Um, and maybe I'll ask you maybe a bit personal is what your co-regulatory kind of practices that you found or you were surprised to like, oh, yeah, this is something really important that gives me a sense of safety, but I never kind of practice it with that intention. So let me ask, answer your first question first. Yeah. <laughs> that, well, that just I think in just in terms of my work. I, what I find is that um, being able to address the many different levels and layers that people experience in terms of safety or danger, I think are very important and being able to name them. So with my clients, you know, contextually looking at intergenerational stuff, historical stuff, uh, what's happening in terms of their communities, what's happening in terms of families, et cetera. So really mapping things out for looking at it from the broader context and, and sort of looking in to see what, how is this affecting me? Um, in my own personal life, I think polyvagal theory has also transformed me personally because um, every time I give a hug to somebody or every time I receive a hug, you know, I, I really take time to sort of cherish it, relish it. Um, fill my body up with all those oxytocins that are, are there. Um, the connection, I think now I'm more intentional when I go to um, gatherings, when I go to um, either religious gatherings or community gatherings or fun gatherings, just what's happening, the energy that's happening there, how we are communicating, how I am allowing for safety for others. And what is it that other people are doing that are making me feel safe? So I very recently, I was in a, in, a, in a setting where I was new, I didn't know anybody. And, you know, there were one or two people that came right in and say, hello, welcome me so warmly and let me connect you to this person and that person. And it just felt so good in that moment, you know, just that, that those one or two people coming forward. So I think I, I'm more intentional in making sure that I get to ventral at least a few times a day <laughs> is my my way of regulating, whether it is being in the sun or whether it is, you know, connecting with people or whether it is just looking out and looking out in nature. But it's, uh, it gives me a way to say, okay, uh, this is where I am in my nervous system and what do I need to do to shift out of that? 
Yes, absolutely. Or if I need to stay in that a little bit. Or if I need to stay yeah. more in that, exactly. Or if I'm like fully yes. in dorsal and I'm like, okay, I don't want to. I just need to curl up in a corner for now and not do anything else. And allowing myself, giving myself permission to do that. Yes, uh, that's um, that. I find that personally very useful. I just want to share, you know, your um, your, you talk about tea, coffee in, in my family is very important. It's a, a kind of a thing my grandmother used to do, and it's still kind of a ritual. So when anyone talks about coffee, it's like, no, coffee is, is not just the caffeine. It's the sitting together. It's, it's the family time. And I do that with my kids today. And it's like, it, it connects me. That experience connects me to my grandmother and exactly. that it has been uh, done. So, well, thank you so much for uh, a rich conversation. I know every point we could have went a whole hour on it, but it's so important. And I hope again, start questioning where you are in, um, in your traditions, in your practices and uh, how we can really claim, I think, uh, what is mental health uh, for us. Thank you so much. And I hope uh, to meet you again soon one day. Thank you so much. It was such a joy to have this conversation with you. Yes.